Lord God, you've heard the, the requests that were made, so they're in your, your heart, and we're going to trust that you're going to take care of the folks for whom we're praying. Uh, guide and direct us as we go about looking at your word that not only do we understand it better, but we're able to apply it better. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. amen. Okay, uh, we're, we're going to look at, and this, this really goes along with what you all will be doing later when, you, when the Chosen comes back and you're watching those, because you get a little idea of, the, of Jesus, his life, at least as presented through the Gospel of, of Mark. And um, we, we started that in, in Sunday school during the summer, uh, and then uh, we kind of left at a close to the, we didn't go very far, uh -huh. you know, because it, we didn't go very far. Uh, so what we, what y'all said you'd like to do is to go through it. And this will give you a background. So when you look at a life of Christ, at least this is the way one person uh, recorded it. Me too. And um, so that's what we're going to look at. So today what we're going to look at is we're going to look at an introduction and we're, then we're going to look at the first 13 verses. Okay. Um, Mark what? Ma we're going to look at Mark 1, chapter 1, 1 through 13. Okay. okay. Now, but as, we, as, we, think about, as we, we think about Mark, there's a couple of things that I want you to sort of file away. Um, we've got four different Gospels written by four different people at four different times to four different audiences. Now, if you were looking at the early church could have taken one Gospel and said this is the right one and all the others including the other 100 gospels that were floating around you know none of those are are true this is the one we're going to use in fact there was a guy named Marcion around the year 180 AD that that's what he did he said the gospel of Luke is the only one true one and that's what he used in his in his new testament uh, but the early church didn't do that they said we've got four gospels like I said, written by four different people at four different times to four different churches, audiences, with all their backgrounds. So the early church recognized that you're talking about four stories dealing with Jesus, all of whom were, all of these written long after Jesus is gone, way after Jesus is gone. And so each of them are a little bit different because the goal, and we're going to talk about that today, the goal isn't to present the, uh, the um, biographical facts about Jesus. You know, as an impartial reporter, writing the facts. Instead, all the Gospels are presenting the good news about Jesus. And in other words, why is Jesus important? You know, why do we worship him? And each of the evangelists are going to look at Jesus in slightly different ways. And the early church, the folks in the earth weren't stupid. They realized that they're looking at Jesus in four different ways. And they felt all four views are important. You know, it's like reading a biography, four different biographies of George Washington. You're going to get four different perspectives on who he was and why he's important. It doesn't mean one's right and the other three are wrong. It means you've got different opinions and they're all shaping the story to make the point they want to make. And that's what we see in the Gospels. Uh, we've got four evangelists shaping the story to make the point they want to make. Uh, I'm good to, always good to start with uh, Mark because Mark would seem to be the first of the Gospels of the four, probably written around the year 70 AD. This is just some background. Around 70 AD. Now, uh, why, would, why would 70 AD, why might that be important? That's when Jerusalem was destroyed. That's when Jerusalem was destroyed. And, and it would appear as though there are places in Mark uh, as opposed to the other. The other three Gospels were written much later. Probably written much later. And there are weeks, sometime we could talk about that, why they're probably written later and stuff you could see in the Gospel themselves. Uh, much later than Mark. Um, the um, Mark, there are places in Mark where the evangelist doesn't seem to know that the temple has been destroyed, that Jerusalem has been destroyed. The other evangelists seem to know that because they talk about it, but Mark doesn't seem to, to know that. Um, therefore, it was probably earlier. It was probably before the, the temple was destroyed, uh, which was, man, that, 
that was for the Jews, 71 was a pivotal event. Everything changes in Judaism. Uh, I mean, when I say error, I mean everything changes in Judaism when the temples, the Romans destroy the temple. Um, and, and Mark would seem to predate, would seem to predate that. Um, we, we, can, we can learn some things about the, uh, the evangelist himself. Uh, know that he, he wasn't proficient in Greek. He didn't know Greek very well. Um, Luke does. Luke's Greek is so good, it's hard to translate. Uh, John's Greek is Dick and Jane Greek. Uh, I mean, you, I can sight read John. John's really easy. Uh, but uh, Mark is hard. It's, it's hard because it's so awkward. His phrasing is awkward. His grammar is awkward. His word choice is awkward. You know, it just, he's just awkward. He, if you would talk, if he would do it, turning this in for a grade to a teacher, the teacher would give him a C on, on the, the grammar because it's just not written in a very polished, smooth way. Now, one of the things that we're going to see, and we're going to see it in fact today, as people translate, uh, as they copied it, they often smoothed out things, <laughs> you know, later copiers. So they weren't trying to preserve his actual words. They try to make it smoother. And there are places where they just change stuff that they think is wrong. Uh, but Mark, as we go back to the earliest, is, is really kind of awkward, which would indicate that he, he didn't, wasn't very proficient in Greek. Uh, he didn't know Palestine. So he, he, wasn't, he didn't live in, in Palestine because he has Jesus going from, uh, later we'll see, uh, he'll have Jesus going from one place to another, and it's one of these things you can't get there from here. You know, he, he, geographically, he, you can't do what he said Jesus did, uh, which means he just didn't know geography. He didn't know Palestinian geography. He's not a bad guy. He just didn't know it. Uh, so he probably wasn't, wasn't a native there, and he didn't have a strong Jewish background. Mark couldn't have had a strong Jewish background because he does something that, that Matthew does, and I don't think Matthew, Matthew's written, I think, to Jews, but not to uh, a sophisticated Jewish audience. He explains Hebrew words. Uh, so when, he, when a Hebrew word is dropped in there, uh, John, uh, Mark will translate it. Uh, when Jesus from the, from the cross, um, uh, his last words from the cross, uh, G, Mark translates it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He doesn't, he doesn't leave it in Hebrew. He translates it into Greek, which means the people reading his gospel didn't know Hebrew. Therefore, Mark needed to translate it. Uh, he'll translate customs. You know, well, why do the Pharisees do this? Well, it's according to the law. So Matthew, uh, Mark does it. Matthew does the same thing, tends to do the same thing. Luke does it. He drops in all this Jewish stuff, but he doesn't explain it, which means his audience must have known what it meant, you know, that he didn't need to explain it. They already knew. Matthew's audience didn't. Mark's audience certainly didn't. Question. May I ask? Yeah, sure. It, you, when, when Jerusalem was destroyed, you said the, the, the uh, Jewish um, uh, law changed. Or Jewish religion, religion changed. changed. Is yeah. it because, you know, Jesus predicted to them what was going to happen? They told them what was going to happen, and they didn't believe him when he said about destroying the temple. Is that why you think that that, that changed their religion? What, what, what happened? When the, when the temple's destroyed, and, and this is more historical than theological, because what you're asking is a theological question. And so I'd say, yes, historically, what happens? And I think we talked about this once the before. The sacrifices stopped. That's right. You, you had in, in Judaism, now understand, 90% of, of Jews running around Palestine, I mean, they were people just trying to survive. You know, and to, when you're trying to survive, you don't, you don't get affiliated with other groups. You don't have time for that. So most of the people are just looking to earn enough to survive, and that's what it was. You made enough in a day to live for a day, and you hope that tomorrow you earned enough for tomorrow to live for tomorrow. But you had, so outside of, of those folks, you had four major groups if you looked at Judaism. You had four major groups. You had a group called Essenes, and they were monks. They were like in monasteries, and so you don't worry about them. They're way out in the desert. Uh, so you had this group called the Essenes. You had zealots who were political revolutionaries wanting to get rid of the Romans. So they're not really religious. They're using religion as a rallying cry 
for political, for politics. Then you had two groups within Judaism, the religion itself, and one group was called Sadducee, and that was from the Hebrew word Zadok, which means righteous. So they were called the righteous ones, and the Sadducees were the they were centered around the temple, and it was temple worship, temple worship, doing the sacrifices. Well, if you read the Old Testament. The, the part of the Old Testament that deals with temple worship is the first five books, the Torah. And so that was the foundation for the Sadducees, the, the first five books of the Bible. They didn't believe that in any kind of life after death because it's not in the first five books of the, the Old Testament. They were passionate about uh, Jewish worship and Jewish worship, uh, sacrificial worship could only occur at the temple. Jews could not perform sacrifices in other places. It had to be here. So they were passionate about the temple. Uh, they also hated the Romans. Hated the Romans because the Romans were infringing on their space. And Jerusalem was their space, particularly the temple. And Pilate was a particular jerk. You know, Pilate was a jerk. And really ticked the Sadducees off. So you had that group. And then you had the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were fascinating. Because instead of focusing on temple worship as the focus of Judaism, they focused on the law as the focus of Jewish worship. And they broadened their focus from not just the, the first five books, but also to the prophets, because the prophets interpreted the law, took the law and applied it to the people. And so what the Pharisees did is they said, a uh, uh, Sadducee would say being a Jew means performing sacrifices in the temple. Pharisee would say being a Jew means obeying the Jewish law. And so you have these two, two groups. Well, the Pharisees didn't mind the Romans. As long as the Romans left them alone, Pharisees were fine. The Romans let them obey their laws in their own little communities. Pharisees were cool. You know, well, I don't care. You know, in fact, that's good because they're letting us, you know, be Jews by following the law. Um, the Sadducees, you know, the Romans were interfering with temple worship. And so when you have the rebellion that occurs in 70, 71, 72, uh, in Palestine, where the Jews, the Zealots, and the, you know, the, the Sadducees rebel against the Romans, and this is going to be our opportunity for freedom. You know, we're going to set ourselves free. You know, the Pharisees weren't a part of that because all the Pharisees wanted to do was be left alone to obey the law. So when the, Jew, when the Romans came in, it was the zealots and the Sadducees that were at Masada. You know, it was the, the uh, zealots and the uh, Sadducees that were in Jerusalem when they destroyed the temple because they were the troublemakers. And the Romans shut troublemakers down immediately. And the one way you kill temple worship is what? Don't have a temple. Don't have a temple. And so you tear down the temple, and once the temple's gone, the Sadducees didn't say, oh, well, we'll, rebuild, we'll build one over there. Sadducees said, you, it's got to be in Drew on the Temple Mount. It's got to be here. And so once the temple was gone, Sadducees disappeared. And so you only have, and zealots are gone. The Essenes are out in the wilderness in monasteries. Did she went down. That was she, the well, she may. We'll, we'll see. The, uh, but then you only got Pharisees left. And I'll tell you, see, that's why when you look at the other Gospels, except for John, and John's really interesting, you know, it's, it's the Pharisees that are the enemy. You know, you don't see Sadducees come in, you know, every now and then. Herodians come in every now and then. But it's the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees, and they were together. They were law people. They're the enemy because by the time you get past 75, that's all you got. That's Judaism now. Is Pharisee Judaism, and it becomes increasingly inward focused. You know, as they start circling the wagons and start trying to redefine their identity without a temple, and uh, the Sadducees are the only, the Pharisees are the only ones left. Uh, and so, the evangelists writing later, near the turn of the first century, they're not going to criticize Sadducees because Sadducees don't exist anymore. So why, why trash the Sadducees? You know, you trash the Pharisees because they are the enemy. Uh, you know, until you get to the Gospel of John, and then it's not the Pharisees aren't the enemy. It's the Jews. The Jews. And that's all over the place. The Jews. And so it just depends on, but it depends on the, the church that's receiving the Gospel. 
You know, what's important to them? What's their experience? Who do they see as an enemy? And that's how the evangelist will shape the story because the gospel is to them to help their faith grow. You know, it's not an impartial history of Jesus. It's to help a particular community experience why Jesus is important. So anyway, with, but that's a, great, that's a great question. So theologically, yes. Historically, no. Because it was the, the Sadducees disappeared. With the, when the temple went down, Judaism changed because half of the Jews ceased to exist because their focus was gone. You know, their so their temple was gone and their land was gone. So the, the zealots, the Romans, kill all the zealots. So you don't have anybody left, uh, you know, except Pharisees and Essenes. And Essenes are in the woods. You know, the Pharisees are the only ones left. And the Pharisees say, leave us alone and we won't cause you trouble. And the Romans, what did, what did I say the Romans were most interested in? Money. Money. And, you know, if somebody says, we'll pay our taxes, just, just leave us alone. The Romans say, hot dog, that's a community we don't have to, you know, we don't have to enforce. We don't have to worry about because they don't pay their taxes, you know. Uh, so that's, yeah, that, that was a historical thing. So anyway, Mark is first. Now, it's, it's really with Mark, he views, and I'm going to say this, kind of do briefly with it. She wants someone. Um, I think she wants to be pecked out. Uh, and, and I'm not showing her the attention. She uh, the... Uh, but she's not spoiled. Oh, no. She is not spoiled. Like Absolutely not. Stop talking. Yeah. <laughs> stop talking to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kids will get right in your face. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, uh, but the, now, one of the things, one of the reasons I think Mark is first before the others, and the others are later, is that about 90% of Mark is in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew uses Mark's flow. Mark and Matthew have the same chronology. Organized, but Matthew puts in his own material and some material that he shares with Luke. He puts it in, but it's Mark's structure. It's basically Mark's structure. Luke, about, about 60% of Mark is in the Gospel of Luke, which would sort of indicate that both Matthew and Luke had Mark in front of them. And put in other material that they had into Mark's story. Mark is just eight verses over 15 chapters. You know, it's short. Matthew is 28 chapters. So Matthew has got a lot more material than, than Mark, but still follows Mark's chronology. You thought Mark's book would be before Matthew. Right? That's, what, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That Mark, that's why I'm saying Mark's is, I think, before Matthew because... You know, Matthew used, seems to use Mark. Mm -hmm. Now, some people have suggested that Mark is later and somebody took Matthew and just pared it down, but that seems less likely. You know, it seems more likely that they had, and some stories are identical. You know, and that's one of the things when you look at Scripture, you look at where different evangelists, on, they're called parallel passages, where one evangelist will change, make some changes. And we'll talk about that today, too. Uh, some changes in when you compare the different gospels. Okay, so Mark seems Mark seems to be first. Uh, has a horizontal view of history. Almost everybody in the God, in the New Testament does past, present, future. Uh, John, the Gospel of John is different. He doesn't have a horizontal view. His is vertical. So don't worry about John. That's why John is challenging. You know, it really is because he views time in a different way. But it's horizontal. Uh, Mark seems to view time as divided into two parts. You know, if you divide human history, you can divide it into two parts. Now, you're going to be able to guess what stands in the middle. What's the hinge on which history turns? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus the coming of Jesus. And so the coming of the Messiah. So history for Mark seems to be bang here. Everything before is, is kind of Old Testament. Everything after is Jesus. Okay, so two That's the time two frame ages. we have now. We well, it, 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 does, it does, although like Paul has a different, you know, he, he sees the same, but he sees an overlap. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus came, but he hasn't come back. Yes. And we're living in between. So he's got an overlap. Mark doesn't seem to have that same, that same overlap. Neither does, does Matthew, you know, uh, but Paul does. And like I said, John is 
you know, everything has to do with how you respond to Jesus right now. And how you respond in five minutes is different than how you respond now. So it's, it's always this way. It's not this way. Um, but that's, so that's what we've, we've got. Let's see, anything else? Oh, one of the other things that, and just to throw out, and this is just to file away in the back of your head before we look at the words, the scripture itself. Um, the, um, uh, in Mark would seem to, as he shapes his gospel, would, would seem to think that Jesus is going to come back soon, uh, which is not a shocker, because when you read Paul, particularly that's the first Thessalonians, uh, which is probably Paul's first letter that he wrote, Paul seems to expect Jesus to come back any minute. Any minute. Any minute. And in fact, it's, that's what he's been teaching because the Thessalonians are saying, we got, we got Christians who are dying. And that's not supposed to happen. You know, all Christians are supposed to be alive when Jesus comes back. What, what happens to dead Christians? You know, and, and Paul in First Thessalonians has to say, well, understand if, you know, those who have died in Christ will rise first and then those who are still living will join him. You know, so he, this is an issue. So the early church seemed to believe that Jesus was going to come back right away. That's another thing that speaks to Mark being early. You know, Mark seems to believe that too. Because if you look at the end, and we'll see this when we get there, there's a ways to go. But in the 16th chapter, there's no, there's no appearances of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. If you look in your Bible, it'll say two endings. It'll have Mark ending in 16, in chapter 16, verse eight, in a very bizarre verse that we'll talk about later, uh, but very bizarre verse. But then after in, your, in every English Bible, it'll say two endings, shorter ending, longer ending. And the shorter ending and longer ending were written later, What written by Mark. Couldn't have been. Uses different vocabulary. Uses different stuff. So a different hand. Whoever wrote those endings didn't write the rest of the gospel. So somebody looked at Mark and said, we must be missing a page. Well, if I can't find it, I better supply it. And it has Jesus' appearances in the, the two endings. Well, I think Mark's gospel ends where it's supposed to end, and he doesn't have an appearance because the next time you see Jesus... It's going to be what is return. Judgment day. Bang! That's the end. And that's how the early church, that's the early church believed that. You know, that boom, Jesus was going to come back tomorrow. Not the case in Luke, not the case in Matthew, because he talks about the ecclesia, the church, in Matthew. And you don't need a church if Jesus is coming back tomorrow. You don't need a church. But Matthew says you're going to have a church and go and make disciples of all nations, that kind of thing. And then Luke has a whole history of the church. So Luke and Matthew don't believe that Jesus is coming back right away. Uh, but Mark seems to. Mark seems to. And John doesn't care. Uh, he doesn't care. Uh, so that's, that's, what's, that's what's going on. Now, uh, if, uh, and the other stuff we'll, we'll, we'll run into as we go through it. Now, if you've got your Bi Bibles open, the most important verse, and we're chapter 1 of, of Mark, the most important verse is chapter 1, verse 1 of Mark. I think Mark's structure is absolutely brilliant. I love Mark's structure. His grammar is horrible, but the structure of his gospel is brilliant. It's, it's the best of the, uh, the gospels, I think. The most important verse in the gospel of Mark is verse 1, Jesus chapter Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Bang. What does, it, what does that verse say? In the beginning of the gospel, about the, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Bang. He, right in that verse... He has told you everything he's going to do. He has given you, told you exactly what he's going to do. Uh, and we talked about that mm -hmm. in, in Sunday school. Yeah. We know, one, this is what? What is, what is he writing? The good news. He's writing the good news. Mm -hmm. Now, in Greek, good news is euangelion. That's the Greek word for euangelion. And I think I've mentioned this before. I know to y'all yes. I have. Yeah. But y'all who haven't, euangelion is a very specific term in Greek. Uh, it was the word used when a, a, an army went out to fight a battle outside the city, like a marathon. When the Persians are invading Greece and the Athenian army leaves the city of Athens to fight the Persian at the Battle of Marathon. Okay? Now, when you're inside the city, what are you thinking as that army is marching out to fight? 
What's going to happen? Yeah. What is going to happen to us? And and why are you worried about that? Why are you worried about what's going to happen? They to don't us? win. You got to do something. If if they don't win, it's going to be different. Bad, bad on you. News. Because if they lose and the Persians lay siege to Athens, then you're going to be eating your pets. <laughs> you're going to be eating Coco Chanel. Oh, you know, dear. you're going to be eating those who run slowly. You know, you, you you're going to be in big big trouble. And when they do breach, I'm sorry. Uh, when they do <laughs> breach, when they do breach the wall and enter the city, you know. Your, your, your occupation is pretty much settled because there was no racial slavery, but slavery was an economic condition uh, and a military condition. You lose the battle. Welcome to your new job description. You know, you are now a slave. And, and so bad things are going to happen. Well, so the army goes out and fights. You're sweating bullets. Not bullets, because they didn't have bullets. But you're sweating whatever they had. Spears. Uh, spears uh, in the city. And, and all of a sudden, you see a guy running from Marathon. And, and what is it? Tw- is it 26? 26.3? Yeah, 26.3 miles. You see a guy, a kid running. 23 point, uh, 26.3 miles. And they come to the gets into the gate, and he says, "We won." We won. And the Greek said, "Thank you for the euangelion." That was what euangelion meant. It was the announcement of victory. When that runner came back and announced that you had won, that was euangelion. That was victory. You had won the victory, which meant you weren't going to have to eat your, your dog. You know, you could take her for a walk instead. Everything was going to be good. Now, that's what he's writing here. So we're talking about a, a victory. He, biography is a Greek word. Biography, he could have said the biography of Jesus, but he didn't. This is not the biography of Jesus. This is the winning good news, the, winning, the good news, the victory won by Jesus Christ. And that is absolutely important to remember because that's how he's going to approach it. He is going to leave out any biological or uh, biographical facts that don't fit into good news because he didn't care. That's not his, his purpose is to put in the story of Jesus. His purpose is to show how Jesus is victory, how there's victory in Jesus. Okay, so we know that from the first verse. We know what he's writing. We also know the, the focus of the gospel. And who is the focus of the gospel? Jesus. Jesus is the focus of the gospel. And after he does Jesus, because sometimes we kind of get the idea that, you know, Jesus, when mail was delivered to his house, you know, it came to J. Christ. You know, on sheets it was Christ, comma, Jesus. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, Christ isn't, wasn't a name. Christ is a, is a title. Christ is a title. And so this is a gospel about Jesus. And I think, understand the, early, the earliest uh, copies of the Bible, the papyri, and uh, the little fragments of the, of the Bible, the codexes, uh, don't have any punctuation. So we have to supply, assume the punctuation. Man, right here, there should be a colon, you know, in English. This is the good news of G. The beginning of the good news and genesis is the word for beginning. So we got all this Old Testament stuff brought in right at the beginning. You know, of Jesus, colon, Christ, the Son, son, of, God. The son of God. Two titles. Two titles. The word Christ comes from the Greek word chrisma, and chrisma means to... Poor. Christmas means the poor. So the Christ is the one, the anointed one, the one on whom the oil was poured. You know, Messiah is Hebrew. Christos is Greek. So he is the Christ. He's also Son of God. And I'll tell you, that's how Mark is divided. If you if you look at the Gospel of Mark from from the, it's a little prologue here. But when the gospel really starts going, and that's going to be verse 14, chapter 114, to 827, uh, and don't worry about that, that's going to be Mark talking about Jesus as the Christ. This is how, he, and that's when he's going to do miracles, and he's going to feed 5,000, and he's going to, you know, cast out demons, and he's going to walk on water, and he's going to do all this big, exciting stuff. And at the end of that, in 827, he will ask 
But who do you say that I am? And Peter says what? You are the Christ. You well, he doesn't say you are the Son of God. That's in Matthew. But in in in, in Mark, he's going to say you are the Christ. And I think that's Mark telling us as a writer, I've done my job. I have established Jesus as the Christ. If you listen to me to this point, you know who he is as the Christ. Title one covered. Title two, Son of God. Now he starts talking about Son of God and the whole tone changes. Because Jesus starts talking about, you know what he starts talking about after? The confession at Caesarea Philippi. So he never said before. The Son of Man, and he never will call himself Son of God. He'll use Son of Man instead. The Son of Man must suffer and die and rise again. And that's what we're going to see in that second half over and over and over again. Instead of the great miracles and the tremendous spectacle, it's going to be Son of Man must suffer, Son of Man must suffer, Son of Man His must disciples suffer. disciples didn't really... And that's what happened. You, we get that right from the beginning because the first time he says Son of Man must suffer, who steps up? Peter. Peter and says, no, you, you better stop talking like this. Yeah. The guy that just said you're the Christ will say, we'll rebuke him, which is a little more than, Jesus, you should f- change your phrasing. It's, he's chewing him out. <laughs> you know, and that's, so at that, in the space of about five verses, Peter goes from making the, the confession to this point in Mark to not being able to accept Jesus as Son of God, suffering Son of God. So he was able to accept him as the anointed one but not as the Son of God until it progresses a little bit. Not, and and what, what's going to be the thing that will enable people to understand Jesus as Son of God? That he rises from the <laughs> It's not going to be the resurrection. It's going to be the crucifixion. Crucifixion. And, and in fact, and that's, that's, what, that's why I think Mark is so cool. The first half ends when Peter says, well, you're the Christ. Mark has done his job. We know what Jesus is as a Christ. The second part half ends when the centurion at the cross and in Mark it says when he saw how he died he, really is he said God. he was the son of God. Mm-hmm. And, and that ends the second part. And what Mark has done in his gospel is he said I'm going to give you the, the victory of Jesus who is the Christ and the son of God and by the time we get to the centurion at the cross he's done it. He's accomplished his goal. He has done what he told us he was going to do in verse 1. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. And you can't understand him as the Son of God until you see him die on a cross. And that's when he shows himself to be Son of God. In Mark, that's not the case in the other Gospels. You know, particularly in John, when Jesus says he's the Son, in chapter 1, he's saying he's the Son. So Mark, John has a whole different perspective. But in Mark... It's going to be the cross where Jesus is the suffering Son of God. That's, that's going to be Mark's deal. So the, and when you look at the gospel itself, you know, Mark has a little over 15 chapters. Two of them are devoted to the, the passion, you know, the, the trial and the death. Two of them. Two of, two of 15. Let's say two of 15. In the gospel of Matthew, you know how many chapters are devoted to the cross? Two. Oh, okay. Well, he uses Mark. Sure. And it is Mark's story. But he's got 28 chapters. So two of 28, the cross is less important. Yeah, it's, exactly. Is, is less important for Matthew than it is for Mark because he devotes less of his gospel, a smaller percentage of his gospel to it than Mark. And for Mark, it's, it's absolutely crucial, understanding Jesus on the cross. So, but we'll, we'll get there. But he tells us, see, that's why I think this is so important, this verse is so important, because he tells us exactly what he's going to do. Verse 1, chapter 1, we already know the structure of his gospel. Man, that's a good writer. Jeez, that's a good writer who tells you what he's going to say. Now, as soon as he does that in verse 2, what does, uh, uh, what does Mark do after establishing his thing? This, this thesis, this idea that he's going to, he's going to, Sort of flesh out. Prophecy that it fulfills. Okay, he says it's it's, it's fulfilling a, a, a prophecy. Now, I want you to think about this because I'm going to suggest something to you that maybe may not be, but I want you to think about it. to this point in in the Gospel of Mark, who has been introduced as a character, and I want you to look at it like a story. So, what character has been Isaiah? introduced? Well, before that verse, and just verse just one, Jesus. Jesus is the only one, right? We don't have anybody introduced. Before 
this prophecy. Mm -hmm. Now, the prophecy could have to do with somebody who hasn't been introduced. Maybe, maybe, as Mark is using it, maybe the prophecy has to do with Jesus and not John. Clearly, the other evangelists believe the prophecy is about John because they introduce John before the prophecy. So we already have John in the story, and then John came to fulfill prophecy. We don't have that in Mark. We don't get John introduced until Four. after the prophecy. So maybe the prophecy is about John, or maybe it's about Jesus. Don't know. One thing that is, that's really clear, and this is one of those things that uh, you kind of file away, this is one of the mistakes that Mark made in his gospel. And it's just a mistake that was corrected by copyists later. He said, this is prophecy. What, what prophet is this? Is he talking about? He says it's Isaiah. It's not. It's, it's not. It's, it's, it's Isaiah and Malachi. it's Malachi. It's Isaiah and Malachi. So Mark, his citing is, is, is mistaken. One of the things that's really interesting when you start studying scripture is some of the later copies and their copies correct this. And if you see some of the later copies, it says the prophets, which makes it right. Somebody's come in and corrected a mistake they saw, and it is a mistake. And that's probably why it's accurate, because nobody would make a mistake. You'd correct a mistake. So this is probably... So what, what, what does he say? What's the prophecy that either John is fulfilling, or I think in Mark, Jesus is fulfilling? What is, what's being fulfilled? What, what does he say? Gospel the way is being made. Okay, I am sending my messenger before you, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. now, if you're, if you're looking at, if, you're, if you're, you're thinking about possibility, who could be the I? I am sending my messenger before you. Who is the, who is the I in the reference? God. God? Now, who is the you? What well, could be Jesus, or it could be Jews. Could be the Jews. Could be us. Could be. Don't know. If it's if he, this is talking about Jesus, it ain't Jesus. The you ain't Jesus. It's us. Okay? So he's sending, and what is that, what is that messenger gonna do? Make the, prepare the way. It's gonna prepare the way, and where is it gonna prepare the way? The in, in the desert. Now, this is really interesting. When you look at this in the other gospels. And all of them have to fulfill prophecy, the prophecy. They don't, this isn't what they, they do this thing from Isaiah, but they don't use the Malachi. And the Malachi is the beginning. I'm sending my messenger before you. That's, that's from Malachi. And when you look at the passage in Malachi, in the Old Testament, Old Testament prophet, minor prophet, it has to do with judgment. It's, this is a judgment passage. So if, if when Mark is writing this, He's thinking about what Malachi wrote. He's bringing a judgment image into this that the other evangelists don't. So again, then it makes some sense that Mark expected Jesus to come back right away. When Jesus came back, there'd be judgment of the world. This is part of the end of the world kind of deal, his, his coming. You know, if this applies to Jesus, you know, I am starting this end. God is saying, my time is... The time is now. We're, we're on the threshold of the end. Now, if the other evangelist chose to take that out and just stick with Isaiah, which is all, you know, kind of a liberation, that's the hope, you know, you've been captive, you well, want to come home. Well, that changes the outlook of it because one is looking for Christ to return now. The other ones are saying we've got to endure this until the That's end. it. That's it. And think about the different churches you would send that to. If, if you were sending, if I was sending a, a letter that said, you know, I know things are tough, but, but you've just, you, you've got to endure it because you've got a job to do. Or if I say, look, it's going to end any day now. You know, sell, sell your stuff. Because Jesus, if he's not here today, man, he's, he's going to be here tomorrow. Now, which, which would be, uh, which, what would be the different situations in those two churches? If that's the message you're receiving, you know, what would be the difference in conditions? What are your expectations? How are the expectations? One is you prepare to endure. The other right. is you just get rid of everything and just wait for it to happen. 
Exactly. And I think that's what we see. And that's why, that's why in Luke, Acts is so important. Because Acts is telling the church that's getting Luke, the gospel of Luke. Acts is telling them, look, the church is going to be here for a while. You want to you follow the example of the church in Acts because it's going to be here for a while. You know, Matthew, you know, go and make disciples of all nations. You're going to be there for a while. You're not going to do that next weekend. You know, okay, I did that next weekend. What's next? You know, that's going to take a long time. You know, and I'm going to be with you the whole step of the way. You know, that's an ecclesia church that's going to be around. You know, Mark, and when Paul is saying to the Thessalonians, you know, understand Jesus is going to take those who are living with him, but he's going to take those who have died, who have died first. So find comfort in these words. Well, you're only going to find comfort in these words if you expect him to come now. To come now. You know, to come right now. And, and that's how you find comfort in the words. It's not that one is wrong and the other. You're just writing to different contexts, to people in different situations. You know, after 50 years, you, you cannot wait every day for Jesus to come back. You know, you, you can't do it. You, you just burn out. Uh, and so we've got evangelists that are saying, well, not that's not part of the process. If you're not preparing for the future, you have nothing to survive on. And, and what makes it even worse is my grandfather was a Christian. He died. My father was a Christian. He died. Now I'm a Christian. And you want me every day to be waiting for Jesus to come back? You know, I got a kid. Is he going to be waiting after I die too? You know, you, you got to tell more that this can't be what's, what's, what's happening. I'm not, going to st I'm not going to stick with Christianity if that's what it means. You know, generation after generation, we're just, we, got, we own nothing because we're waiting. Can't do it. And so that's why we get Acts and that's why we get Luke and that's why we get other letters, later letters, that talk about a church that's developed. And this is what you can do in the world that you got. Because they're late, they're written to people who are facing different situations or feeling different things. Okay, so we've got, we've got this. We've got whether, and I think, like I said, it has to do with Jesus. You know, Jesus is going to be this figure of judgment. Jesus is going to, uh, is the messenger of God, you know, preparing a way in the wilderness, which is a way of liberation, but also of judgment, this co combined imagery that's used. And then in verse 4, boom, who do we have introduced? John the Baptist, first reference. And where is John the Baptist? In the desert. He is in the desert. And, and the, understand the desert and the wilderness is the same Greek word, translate. Now, if you say desert, we got a geographic location, right? But if I say John the Baptist is in the wilderness, how might the wilderness be more significant than just the desert? More confusion? Okay, more confusion because it's less specific. I'm a Jew. I'm not a sophisticated Jew. He's not a, definitely not in the city of Jerusalem. Okay, not in the city of Jerusalem. If I'm a Jew and I hear somebody say he's in the desert, okay, he's in the wilderness. He doesn't understand. What, what, what would wilderness, what might wilderness mean to a Jew who at least knows a little bit about the Old Testament. They aren't finding their way. They're camping. Okay. They, well, the Israelites uh, oh, wandering. the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. You know, how long was they in the wilderness? 40 years. 40 years. So all of a sudden, you've got John showing up where? Up there in the wilderness. The same place that the Jews wandered for 40 years. Jeez Louise, that's loaded, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that all of a sudden that takes on more significance that he's, you know, he needs a canteen. <laughs> you know, he's in a theologically significant place. He's in the winter. That's going to come up a little bit later. And what's he doing? Baptism. Baptism. Okay. Baptism he's he's proclaiming repentance. a baptism of repentance, repentance for the. Oh, very good. Repentance. The Greek word means to turn your mind. That's what it means literally. To change, so he's preaching a message about turning their minds, which means you turn to God, to from you turn from and you turn to, and so that's what he's he's preaching. And how does the baptism work into that? What is this connection? So he's preaching. You got to change your your perspective. You got to turn from the stuff you've been doing now. To, to God. You got to, that's repentance. You've got to turn your mind. 
You got to change your vision. How does baptism fit into this? It's a physical um, acclamation. You're going to make it. That it becomes. It, yeah. It's like you know, validate my ticket. <laughs> you know I'm here. You know, stamp my card. Yeah, put me down. Sign me up for a contribution. You know, it is a tangible demonstration that you're do, you're actually doing what you promised to, to do. do. Okay, and and who is who is coming? The whole. Oh team Lord, team have team mercy, everybody! All the people from Judea. Yes, everybody from Judea and everybody from Jerusalem. Is everybody historically is that an accurate comment? Probably. Probably not, but we're not worried about historicity. We're worried about, we're thinking about story. So what Mark is telling us is, John was doing that and people were, cheating. People were coming. People were, were coming. And, and when they were baptized, what did they do that signified this change of mind? Confessing. They were confessing. Yes. They were confessing this. And why would baptism be a perfect external expression of confessing, turning your mind? And, and it's interesting. The order is repentance and confession, not the other way. You know why would yes? Because the water would cover over their sins. Sure. Water. Water's cleansing. Yeah. I took a shower this morning. I was well. That's kind of personal. I'm sorry. Um, uh, you know, that's that's. Uh, I was fully clothed, uh, so I don't want. I don't want to do that. So I was fully clothed. Um, yeah, that. He did his laundry at the same time. Yeah, that, that's exactly. It. Not unlike the guy who said he never needed to wash his towels because he was always it was always around water. His towels were always around with soap and water, so he never needed to wash them because they were always clean after he showered and dried off. Uh, yeah, so, but, but it's a cleansing. What a, what a wonderful image for cleansing. You're under the water, you're, you're clean. In fact, you know, I told you about that group called the Essenians. Baptism was not new when John was doing it. The Jews baptized a lot. In fact, the Essenians would baptize every day because every day you needed to be cleansed. So there was a cleansing, a ceremonial cleansing every and single day. And all the washings and stuff with, at the temple before they could do that. Absolutely. It's, it's, it becomes this symbolic cleaning. So this is how it's, John is using it. This is the, the external act of, of cleansing. Now, don't want to confuse it, though, with Christian baptism because we see in Acts that it's sort of redefined. Mark isn't going to deal with it because Mark doesn't deal with the church later. But we see that in Paul and we see that in, particularly in Acts. But this is so that's what John is doing. Now, how is John described? Uh, he's kind of a loner. He's kind of a, he's kind of a loner. Yeah, he's a little eccentric. You know. Where's weird clothes? He well, I don't know. Have you have you priced a camel's hair jacket lately? They ain't cheap. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he was wearing a custom-made camel hair jacket. Uh, the, uh, he had a leather belt. Yeah, a leather belt. Yeah, he had a leather belt. He had an interesting diet. Because the of, you know, the linen and all that stuff would have been much more expensive. Oh, absolutely. This is probably a bum clothes. <laughs> kind of, kind of bumish clothes, you know. Oh, and and um, what did he eat? Locust. Locust. Locus. Would you mean? I, I need to pick up groceries later. So would you remind me of this later? Buy some locusts. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, it's that's one of those. It's it's a Kellogg cereal that didn't catch on. <laughs> it was uh, locusts and wild honey. Like and yeah, that yeah they they yeah it was yeah like grape nuts. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> they, they thought it would compete against kicks, but uh, you know locusts and wild honey was probably not the best name. And, and having little bugs in there, you know, uh, just wasn't. Leprechauns were stars in. And, and and rainbows were better than than locusts and worms. Lucky charms. Uh, yeah, lucky charms and locusts and honey. They would have covered uh, the locusts in chocolate. And maybe yeah, maybe. Uh, well, I had, I've had grasshoppers and and uh, have you ants well, covered in chocolate. Are, yeah. Is oh yeah, I had a friend of mine that used to. Yeah. When I was out west, there were locusts everywhere. I mean, that's and grasshoppers. And he would. He didn't do it. He did it to show off. Is what yeah. he did. I mean, he didn't do it for a but, diet. But he he. Pop off the legs of a grasshopper. I think what he's showing is that he didn't have to pay for his food. 
Okay. Yeah. You know what I'm saying is because you can the wild honey and the man. Yeah, that's and right. That's right. You didn't have to pay he had to. All he had to do was this. <laughs> <laughs> and I got lunch. And you was know. Living. Yeah. He wanted one no. the lives. So <laughs> yeah. And not. I'll tell you. Not unlike. Oh. Not unlike a piece of lasagna. I was given at a funeral dinner oh. that looked like somebody had stepped on it. <laughs> uh, but that was neither here nor there. Um, you know, the, uh, so locusts, uh, now one of the things that's really interesting when you look at, when you look at it, this is, yeah, he won't mind it, he'll eat anything. Uh, you know, the, uh, yeah, that's right. This is, this is how the prophets in the Old Testament, particularly Elijah, is described. You know, that, that he was kind of wild and ready and you know, so John takes on this Isaiah image. And Isaiah will become important later because the Jews believe something really specific about Isaiah. Not, not Isaiah, Elijah. Something very specific about Elijah. What did the Jew, do you know what the Jews believed about Elijah? He didn't die. He didn't, you remember the, the Elijah never died. He was taken up into heaven, fiery chariot. Okay? And so Elijah, Elijah saw this and got hey, that's right, got the mantle, and you know, then had a bunch of kids killed by bears because they made fun of his bald head. Yeah. Read the story, Elijah. <laughs> that was in the story. Yeah, yeah. In, yeah in but the first he, Elijah did burn his um, his plow and eat his oxen before. He yes, came. yes, he did, which was was a lot. <laughs> you know, well, eating a whole lot. There was no going back. Why yeah, would you burn right. your oxen? Because you, well, don't, you, go you don't go back. back. You I don't understand go back. that somebody else could have. Used those well, he was a big eater. <laughs> uh, he was a healthy boy. Uh, you know. But, but uh, Elijah was considered really because he didn't die. And because he didn't die, the Jews expected... Well, that's why they kept, kept asking, are you the Elijah, are you the this, are you the that, because they figured he would come back. He would come back. He never died. Therefore, at the end, Elijah would come back. You know, since he was the one, he, and there was another guy who didn't die. Who didn't die? Enoch. Enoch didn't die. Enoch didn't die. And there's a lot of stuff with Enoch's visions and that kind of stuff. But the Jews believe that Elijah, since Elijah never died, he's going to come back before the end. And so when we got John the Baptist described like Elijah, okay, okay. Carries on weight. We get, yeah, it carries kind of weight. The way John, remember Mark is shaping the story. You know, so he's shaping it to make the reader say, hmm, this kind of looks like Elijah to me. So Jesus may be the one who is going to bring in judgment because that's what the Jews expected. When Elijah came, hold on to your hats. Judgment day is on its way. And it sure would appear that he's portraying John the Baptist in an Elijah type way. Isn't it interesting that in the Transfiguration that Elijah is exactly. one, one of the people that's there? Exactly. And, and in the Gospel of Mark as opposed to Matthew. And this is one of these little things that you look for, and, but they cause you to go, oh, that's interesting. When in the Transfiguration, your mountaintop, Jesus appears, you know, uh, is with Moses, Moses and Elijah. In, in Luke and Matthew, it says that Jesus was with Moses and Elijah. In the Gospel of Mark, it says Jesus was with Elijah and Moses. Gives precedent to Elijah. Yeah. Which may mean that Mark see is, sees Elijah as more important yeah. in this context than Moses. The other two switch the order because they the see Elijah more as more important than Elijah. Because Jesus is becoming less a figure of judgment and more the beginner of something that is new. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's really, it. but you look for the little things like that and you say, oh, I wonder why they changed the order. Why would one give precedent to one and the other two give precedent to the other one? Huh. Maybe, how they maybe. see it, how well, they, they represent. represent. Yeah, it's, it's what, what it represents. Exactly. Because you got to assume they had a reason for doing it. If you assume, well, there's no reason, then you can't interpret anything. Because, you know, everything is relative. Anyway, so we've got, he's there, and, and so we get this symbol of judgment and of salvation because the Malachi is judgment, the Elijah, or the Isaiah passage is, is salvation. And here John is, and what was John's message? Somebody's coming after me who's more powerful than yeah. I. Someone, 
is coming after me more powerful than I, and then a horribly awkward little thing about untying sandals that Mark has, and the other one's kind of smoothed out, so you don't worry about Mark, it's really a mess. And well, the lowest servant would be the one that did the sandals. Right, well, it, it, so it, he, he wasn't making John have a lot of authority. Right. But he was important. Sure, and and what what I meant, if you read Mark, if you can read, if you read the Greek in Mark, you translated, he's not worthy to stoop down and take a strap of a sandal and do, tie it around and undo it in a way that is, it's really really awkward. And you read the other ones, it's unfastened sandals. It's really easy. So they smooth out this really awkward phrase because Mark is a mess. Mm -hmm. He's in a mess in what he writes. But what he says is powerful. So he's not worthy. What are the two figures? We got two figures then. You know, we got he somebody's coming greater than him. Jesus. And we the reader know because we the reader know what? We read verse one. We read verse one. So we got a good idea that it's Jesus. And we also are Christians, so we know Jesus anyway. You know, so we know it's Jesus. And Mark John says, according to Mark. What's the difference between the two? What is the difference? One is worthy between and one is not worthy. Okay, what, what does he say? Greater. Greater, and then how do they con compare? John does water. I do Jesus water, does and Jesus, Jesus does, does spirit. spirit. I do water, Jesus does spirit. Now understand, that's all in Mark. That John, Mark, that John the Baptist says. He doesn't talk about the winnowing fork. He doesn't talk about separating grain. He doesn't tell soldiers to be happy with their pay. You know, in the other Gospels, he says a lot of stuff. This is it in Mark. This is all he says. You know, that someone greater than me is coming. I baptize you with water. He's going to baptize you with, with Holy Spirit. Do they know? I mean, I've asked this once before. Do they know at this point that they're cousins? In Mark... There's no indication that there's any relationship okay. between them. Now, I think for reasons, and sometimes if we study Luke, there's all kinds of reasons why Luke has them as cousins. A lot of reasons, internal to Luke. But there's no indication that they're cousins in any other place, not in, in any of the other three Gospels and nowhere else, that there's a relationship. In fact, you almost get the impression in, in Mark that John is much older, uh, is an older person, because he's been doing this. But for a while. Wasn't, wasn't it when Mary was, was pregnant with Jesus and went to her, she was Six pregnant months. with Six Yeah. Months yep. And that they, yep. the baby jumped like he knew. Yep. yep. So. That's Luke. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. And you're right. No, 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 don't be sorry. Because that's one of the things that I, that I want to encourage you to, to not do. And it's real tempting. Uh, I mean, and great theologians, John Calvin did this, and I think he was mistaken. Don't borrow pieces from other gospels. Yeah. and bring it in. Because what you end up is a, you, you confuse the story. Uh, Luke, Luke really has Jesus and John like parallel figures. Yeah. That's a big deal in Luke. That's not important in the, in the other Gospels. Yeah. And so the, he has them related. Um, also tying Jesus to priests. It, it's a lot of stuff going on in Luke that you don't see in the others. Uh, but but in, in this, this is it for John the Baptist. I mean, this is it. You know, he says this because as soon as this happens, you know, he makes this. This is what I'm going to do. Bang, we've been waiting for this. Who enters the story for the first time other than his name has been mentioned, but that was by the writer. Jesus. Now Jesus enters. And the writer tells us who he is. He's Jesus of Nazareth. from yeah. Nazareth in Galilee. Understand in the Gospel of Mark, there's no birth story, no Bethlehem. no Bethlehem, no going to Egypt, you know, no settling in Nazareth. None of that is in Mark. None of the temple story. None of the temple. Well, Jesus is a boy. That's not in Mark. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. Just it, it either Mark, it Mark either didn't know about it or it wasn't important to his story. It would just confuse his story. So he doesn't mention it. This is where Jesus is introduced to you. This is when he first comes into the story, in Mark's this, story. This would be when he was actually the Christ. Because as a child, while he was still the Christ, he didn't have, he didn't do anything about it. Other than in Luke, the story of him at the temple. But even when they, in Luke, when they take him to the temple to present him as an infant, mm -hmm. you know, Simeon and Anna say, oh, this is the one I've been waiting for. 
You know, he's the one that's going. So they're aware of him. You don't get any of that in Mark. You know, it's Mark, Jesus is stepping out of darkness. We have no idea how old he is. We have no idea in Mark what he's been doing. You know, let's say he's in his twenties. You know, we got nothing in in Mark because Mark either doesn't know it, which he may not know it, or he doesn't care. You know, because this doesn't help him tell us about Jesus, who is the Christ and the Son of God. That doesn't help him convey it. Well, that would kind of undermine those principles if he was human. Well, that's you know, we, you, that, right. Well. Good. Hold that for just a second. What happens at the baptism? So Jesus shows up, and what happens? He gets baptized. Okay, he gets baptized. Now, what do we know when he gets baptized? We already know some things about Jesus. For Mark, what has Mark already told us about this guy who's being baptized? He's the Son of God, and he's the Christ. He's the Christ, and he's the Son of God. We already know that, because Mark told us. Now he's getting baptized. Now, this is a... I'm telling you something, ladies. This is a big deal in the early church. This is a big deal. We don't worry about it at all. We don't even think about it. We don't dwell on it at all. But this was a big deal. Why was the baptism of Jesus a big deal in the early church? And I'm not talking about big deal like theologically important. It was a big problem in the early church. People who were trashing Christians were pointing at this. You know, why was it a problem for Christians in the early church, the baptism of Jesus? I don't know. Think about why it. Why did he have to be baptized? He didn't have any sins. What was the purpose of the baptism? To cover the well, yeah, sins. Oh, yeah, that. Yeah, repentance and confessing sins. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. why would Jesus be baptized then? And then, well, the heavens open? The well, that's going to happen. But the problem is... Why was he? Why did he have I, to be well, baptized? I always wondered. I always wondered that you know, too. why did he? If he did, if he was sinless, why was he baptized? To now, show. Well, it's really interesting. <laughs> if you look at the different gospels, this is a problem. And all evidently, it was part of the tradition because all four gospels deal with this baptism. Very few stories about Jesus are found in all four gospels. Baptism is one of them because it was a big issue. It's a it's a big problem. Just as big as the cross. The cross is going to be a big problem. Why he died on a Roman cross, but the Jews were responsible. That's a big deal. You know, how do you explain that? We're not there yet, though. But the baptism is, is a theological problem. And different evangelism, evangelists explain it in different ways. Uh, if you look at Mark, Mark is just bare bones. He came, John baptized him, move on. Boom. Doesn't seem to be important to John or, or to Mark at all. Doesn't seem important. If you look at this in Matthew, if you look at the, this story in Matthew, Jesus comes to be baptized by, by John. Do you think that the baptism would be putting our sins on him so that he could die for them? Well, according to, according to Matthew, in Matthew, when he comes, John says to him, Oh no, oh no, I can't, I can't baptize you. You should baptize me. And Jesus says, No, you've got to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So that's how the evangelist Matthew explains why Jesus was baptized. And I think he would probably agree with what you said. Matthew. Mm -hmm. In Luke, which is fascinating, and check on it when you get home, never says John the Baptist baptized Jesus, hmm. which is kind of interesting. Never said he baptized him. And that was Luke's separating John the Baptist from the baptism. Uh, in the Gospel of John, John the Baptist tells people. He describes what happened. So he becomes a witness. But um, uh, Matthew is really the only one that tries to explain away or to explain why Jesus was baptized. Mark seems to not care at all. It's almost like if this bothers you, I'm sorry. I'm not dealing with it. Uh, because he just, he just says he was baptized. That's it. What's important in Mark, though, is what comes after the baptism. Uh, I think, I think in, in a certain, to a certain extent, I think in Mark, uh, as Mark presents Jesus, I don't think Mark saw Jesus as someone who knew who he was before the baptism. Okay. That Mark doesn't see. I mean, you can't say that if you read Luke. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, he was a boy in the temple teaching the, the elders. Yeah. You know, certainly Mary would have told him about Simeon and Anna. And the story, you know, the, those. So he would have been oh, aware. Was yeah, yeah, yeah was that's right. He would have been aware of that. Yeah. And even in Matthew, you know, he was in Egypt. He came from Egypt. He went here, he went there. You know, so it was more, comp more about his childhood. Would have been a greater awareness. We don't see any of that in Mark. So I think there's a better than even chance that as Mark viewed Jesus, he didn't see Jesus as, as knowing all the stuff that he had to have known in the other Gospels. And do you, do you think the baptism be, uh, um, was because the Holy Spirit, the heavens opened, the Holy Spirit come down on him? Good. Let's talk about that. Thank you. Because this is, for Mark, this is crucial. The baptism is not for Mark. It, like, it is in Matthew, but it isn't in Mark. What happens after is crucial. And what happens after? The that, baptism. The Holy Spirit comes down in the shape of the yeah. dove, and then okay. God speaks. Okay. Now, John, if you look at verse 10, you're looking at verse 10, John, uh, not John, Mark, uses one of his favorite words. And I hope it's in your translations. Because it's, it's a word that Mark uses all the time in his gospel. What, what is the word that, I know in mine it, 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 it has it, uh, what, what's the first word in verse 10? As Jesus <laughs> well, read, read a little. As Jesus was coming up out okay. of the water, he saw heaven it's, being Okay, it's, it's not that. One of the words Mark uses a lot is immediately. Oh, immediately. Immediately. He uses immediately over and over and over again. Now, as a writer, if I'm using immediately a lot, what am I trying to do with the story? What am I doing for you, the reader? Emphasizing. Emphasizing and moving it. You know, this isn't, he didn't hang around here for a day and then spending a week there and then everything is happening. Boom, 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 boom. And that's what Mark does. He drives the story. Everything is immediately. And here it is, first time he uses it. Immediately when he comes out of the water, what, what happens? And I want you to look at it kind of carefully. What happens when he comes out, when Jesus comes out of the water. It says the heavens are torn open. Okay, who saw it? I was wondering if Jesus else saw it. it. He saw it, right? I think that's really important. Did anybody Jesus, else? Ah, very good, Jelly. We're going to think we'll kind of come back to that yeah, in a minute. Okay. <laughs> uh, but he, he saw heavens, and did he see heavens? the heavens open? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. What did he? Is that the word he uses? He's torn. Open. Torn. 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 Oh. torn open. Torn open. Now that's interesting too, because in the other in the other gospels, when the it says the heavens opened. Now, when you think of something opening, like the curtain ripping. Like, well, well yeah. when you think of something opening. You think of a door. Mm -hmm. You know, opening. It's not dramatic, right? It's just open. Door. <laughs> Mark says the heavens were. Torn. torn open, were ripped apart. That's what, so the other evangelists change Mark's <laughs> word. Makes open very subtle. Here, it's ripped apart. <coughs> now think about that ripping apart. Be so much more intense. So much more, so much more intense. So much more dramatic. And we've got another place in the Gospel of Mark where something's going to be ripped apart. The curtain. The curtain. Ah, the yeah. temple after the crucifixion yep. is going to be ripped apart. So the same thing is happening at the, at the end as is happening so at right the beginning. Here, I think Mark is really good. Mark great. is telling us the, the, that God ripped apart the Jewish religion, basically. Good. That's, that's great. Because what, when you talk about open, if I open that door, we open the door when we leave. We're going to open the door to leave, right? Okay, open the door to leave. Now, when everybody's gone, what am I going to do to the door? Shut up. I'm going to close it, right? That's easy. You know, and then you later I got session meeting hinges. tonight. Right, Ellen? And, and we're going to... If you rip it off the hinges, there's no... Ah, uh, if I tear it, if I have a piece of cloth, and I rip that piece of cloth, am I going to put it back, it back again? the way it was? Yeah. So not only are we talking about something that is really dramatic, but it's something that can't be fixed. And, and I think that's working here too. This, this separation, God doesn't just open and close. It is ripped right. apart and forever ripped apart. And what happens when the it's ripped apart? Would be permanent. The change is permanent. 
The change is not, you don't, you don't fix it. It's, it's the, the separation then between heaven and earth has been torn open. Okay? And, and what does he see? The, dove, the, the, the Holy Spirit as a dove. Now, for some reason, Luke says the Holy Spirit in the physical form of a dove. I, I don't know why. I don't know why Luke has it as a physical form. He says, Mark says, he's the Holy Spirit like a dove. So was it, did it have, did it flutter down? You know, I, I don't know. But, you know, it's interesting that Luke wants it to be looking like a bird. You know, he wants it to be a bird. Mark, it, well, it's, it's like a dove. It's easier like a, for it to, be, to believe in something tangible. Maybe, yeah. Than it is for this woo Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. But Luke later, when he talks about the Spirit coming, it's going to be tongues of fire. Yeah. So it's, it's, he's going to use different images. But he's, he's still using yeah. something you can... Tangibly yeah. See. Well, Mark doesn't care. I know. Yeah, Mark doesn't care. <laughs> he, he doesn't. He doesn't care. And and uh, so he he sees this, and then 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 what happens? And then the voice of God, God says, says oh, "You." A voice from heaven. Oh, he says, "What? You, you are, my, are son. my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased." Whoa. Oh, nice. Pronoun? What pronoun does he use? You. Yes. you. Who is then the voice speaking to? His son. His son. He's Jesus. talking to his son. He's talking to his son. Uh, and is this where Christ comes to the understanding in Mark's story? Yeah. I think in Mark's story. Who, and, you know, he really is. Well, that and the, the Spirit rests yeah. on it. Now, it's really interesting. When you look at the Gospel of Matthew, it doesn't say doesn't say you are my son the beloved it says he is my son the beloved in him I am well pleased what's the difference he's talking to everyone he's talking to everyone in 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 Matthew the voice from heaven is talking to everyone who's around everyone who's around the voice in 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 Mark is speaking to who Jesus. 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 Now, who else is hearing it? And this is something I always want you to keep in mind when we're looking at this. Who is hearing this? Well, John, John had to have heard it. Well, maybe. Maybe this could have been a vision. You know, this could have been just personal to Jesus. Yeah. But somebody else heard it. Somebody crucially important heard this. Satan. Hmm? Satan. 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 We're going to find out Satan knows because demons know he's the son. No human being does, but demons do. Even more important. Who hears the voice? Jesus. Now this is a trick question, and I'm going to feel embarrassed when I tell you the answer. Everybody who was Spirit. there. <laughs> who, hear, who hears it? We, we do. do. We do. We hear the voice. And that's really important as you read the, your God, the Gospels. The writer tells us things that people in the story don't know. The writer will tell us motivations. You know, they were bitter in their heart. They wanted to trap him. We'll know things that people in the story don't know. We know. We hear the voice from heaven. No indication anybody else heard it. Because there's nothing in the rest of the gospel. You know, well, wasn't he the guy that the voice came and said, you want the voice from heaven? That's not, that's not even mentioned later in the gospel. That Jesus, you know, remember that guy who was baptized and heard the voice from heaven? You know, there he is. No indication of that. But we hear it. And, and that's really important because we are not, Mark does not want us to be part of the story. Mark wants us to look down on the story. We are looking from God's perspective. We know what God knows as we read the Gospel of Mark. That's the case with all the Gospels. We know what's, what's inside of human hearts. If you're a person in the story, you don't know that. You don't know that, but we do. We hear demons talk. Okay, so anyway, so we've got this, and we're almost done, and this is really exciting. You know, we're really excited because as soon as the baptism occurs, what happens? He goes back to the wilderness. He, yeah. But how does he end up in the wilderness? The Spirit. The Spirit that is now on him casts him into the wilderness, right? Yeah. Why is he in the wilderness? What, and again, the, this theologically significant? Yeah, 40 days. Keep him from, from the... Being tempted by Satan. Well, well, 40 days he's in the world. 40 days. 40 days. 40 days. Oh, I don't know. Whoa, is that? 
40 days would seem to me to be significant. When did we run into 40 before? 40 years ago. 40 years in the yeah. wilderness. Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days. The children of Israel are in the wilderness 40 years. And he was also from resurrection to ascension 40 years. Bango! 40 is important. Ancient people love numbers. Numbers are a big deal to ancient people. Uh, one of the things we'll see when we look at Mark, he loves the number Three. He loves the number three. <laughs> threes are gonna we're gonna see threes everywhere. You know, everywhere. Because he loves three. Uh, not four, but three. Four was considered an earthly number because you have four points to the compass. So four is earthly. Three is a heavenly number. Ancient people love prime numbers too. They just got all excited about prime because they were weird. Prime numbers are weird. <laughs> and, and, you know, ancient people They're like weird things. They're not divisible by anything else. What's that? They're not divisible by anything yeah, Exactly, else. except by themselves. Yeah. And, and that's why they love prime numbers. You know, sevens are a big deal. Elevens are a big deal. Fives. And, and Yeah, they, they just like those because they're weird. Mm -hmm. They're weird numbers. But we're going to run into that. Twelve is important to the Jews because of the twelve tribes. Mm -hmm. You know, three is going to be a big deal. Four is going to be earthly. You know, that kind of jazz. So when, if you ever read Revelation and you run into something that has four heads, that has to do with the earth. If you have four, you know, the four horsemen, that has to do with the earth. If you run into something in a three with three, that has to do with heaven. You know, there'll be three animals around the throne. You know, because three is heavenly number. You know, four is an earthly one. Okay, so anyway, he's in the wilderness now. So we now have his identity reinforced, right? We heard, so, the voice, yeah. right? Okay, so he's in the wilderness, and he's there 40 days, and what is happening to him in the wilderness? Satan, Satan, Satan is, tempting. is tempting him. Now, we read, we read Mark, and we read Matthew and Luke, and they have him in the wilderness. But remember, they had the three temptations, mm -hmm. you know? Three. three, yeah, three. We have the three temptations. In Mark... No three temptations. We get that Satan is tempting him 40 days. 24-7 for 40 stupid days. He's being tested. Now, tested or tempted, the Greek word is the same. You know, so you can use it interchangeably. Now, we have a difference. You know, we hear it different. Tempting is, ooh. Testing is, oh, hmm. Uh, so it's a we hear it a little different, but it's the same thing. Doesn't right. Satan come and test him twice? I mean, was, when, did they he test him when he was in the garden? Te Actually, you could you could really Tempted. say you could really say that he he did, but it's going to be through Peter, because that's the time Jesus is going to say to Peter, "Get behind me, Satan." Satan. Okay. That that Jesus sees that as a satanic temptation. That Peter is making, and Peter is rebuking him for saying the Son of Man must suffer. That that is a testing, that is a tempting, uh, but not not so much in the garden. Okay. Uh, the garden is more Jesus going through that anguish of himself. Himself, at, at least he will in Mark and Matthew and, and uh, Luke. Okay, so he's being tested there. Now, what does what does Satan want to do? Why is he testing him? Why is he tempting him? Because if you can get him to sin, then the plan falls apart. If we can, mm -hmm. before he's even started, because Jesus hasn't done anything. Before he starts his ministry, if, if he can be diverted. Satan wins. Satan wins. So he is being constant, he's being tested for all this time in the wilderness. Uh, and, but it's not specific. You know, it's not a specific. Uh, who is also in the wilderness? Which wild is kind of animals. wild. You look confused, perplexed by wild animals. In the wilderness, there is, there has to be animals, but why are they significant? Wow. Now, <laughs> why would the evangelist Mark? And remember, I've told you before, Mark is writing using papyri. He's writing on papyri. So it's important. And so it is really valuable. One word is a big deal. So that's ex adding a word is important. But the animals wouldn't hurt Jesus. This is, this is being written somewhere around the year 70. Okay. Do you know, happen to know who the Roman emperor is in the year 70? Um, I, I think it's Epiphany. Oh, Nero? Oh, that one's what I was sitting here saying, Nero. Nero. For the, for, for the first time, and remember when Rome burned, Nero blamed the Jews. 
blamed Christians, Christians, Christians blamed Christians. Christians. Got to be for, that's Christ. right. But for, for, for burning down the city. Mm -hmm. You know, and he crucified thousands of Christians, nailed them to crosses along the Appian Way, and then set them on fire, covered them with tar, set them on fire. Uh, Nero was a great guy. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, but at this time, we, we are starting to see, we saw the first glimpse of, of persecution. It's not systematic, so Christians are not being persecuted, you know, systematically by the system, but they, Nero is starting to, this is the first, any kind of persecution. Christians, there were too few of them to worry about before this. And you start having, and one of the ways they persecuted Christians, and it was for their entertainment. It was for the entertainment of the Romans. You've heard of gladiators. gladiators. Well, one of the things gladiator shows weren't just guys fighting with knives and stuff. You know, that would be boring, one right after another. I've seen 10 hours of boxing. Oh, you know, my. 10 hours of boxing. Well, and I love boxing. I used to love it a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, to even, even for me, 10 hours is a long time to watch one boxing match after another. So you've got to vary it a little bit. And that's what they did in the Colosseum. You know, the Colosseum was built to be filled with water, which is fascinating. Oh, they had, you could fill the Colosseum with water, and they had naval battles on, oh, on the Colosseum. It was a big deal. Lions. What? But they... The lions would tear the Christians apart. Ah, one of the things they would do, and they would do it uh, at, at entertainment and again. And people cheered. They, yeah, well, they, they would. What they would do is, and sometimes it was with gladiators. Gladiators would hunt wild animals on the floor of the Colosseum, and they were supposed to kill the wild animals. You know, other places, other times, you put a person down. You know, an old guy down on the Colosseum floor and give him a knife and then set a lion loose. And the entertainment wasn't just him being eaten by the lion, but him, his futile efforts to fight it off and then the lion wins. You have the first time that you, they used wild and exotic animals so in, in Colosseum. this was the first? Could have, been, uh, could have been a little illusion that Mark drops in because his community is going to be facing when, or, or I've heard about it or I've heard about that this is what something that's happening. I think it's intentional that the wild animals are here because that's what some Christians are facing, at least they're facing it in Rome. Like I said, this isn't systematic persecution yet. That's not going to come for another 30, 40 years. But so but it's it's the beginning. And so I think that's why he might have dropped it. But in. when he's writing this, this is almost to the point where it's going to be happening. Well, the, the systematic persecution is going to turn, start around the turn of the century, and that's when Christians... Right now, Christianity is too small, and Christianity is protected by Judaism because the Romans viewed Christians as a Jewish cult, okay. and, as, and Jews had a special protection from the Romans that they're going to lose when they tear the temple down. Right. And as long as the Jews are sacrificing to the emperor in the temple, they didn't have to do certain patriotic things, like participate in community worshiping of the gods. You know, the Jews were excused because they were doing their own thing. When the temple goes down, Jews lose that protection, so do Christians. And that's when Christians start become so, facing do you problems. think this is symbolic of Daniel? I, could be. I think it has more to do with Mark just dropping this in. But it could have to do with that. And the angels protected Daniel. Could be. So could be. Angels, could be. You know, yeah. And by inference, the angels would protect them. It could, certainly could be. Because that's what happens with Jesus. And, and the wild animals are not threats mm -hmm. in this story no, at all. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the angels take care of him, so the angels are doing what for him? Protecting, Protecting him. Protecting him. Feeding him. Feeding him. Feeding him um, talking and, with him. And, 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 For 40 days, I want somebody to talk to him. Yeah. <laughs> he I knew can, there was somebody. I talked to her. There. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, they're also, they're also well, there they're prepa <laughs> they're preparing him. And, and what we're going to see when we look at the well, next... Well, that's important, too, because he just found out... Exactly. You know, yeah. from Mark's story and, here, that he was right. God's son, so they had to give him yeah. information. And the, the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, would give us the same information that we needed to be able to survive. Well, and John, John the Baptist said it in Mark. You know, he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Well, it makes sense now because the Holy Spirit's resting on him. And there's no indication the Holy Spirit left, you know, after the baptism. 
you know, it rested on and fluttered away. It didn't say that. It, it rested oh, no, on. It, it yeah. sent him away. Yeah, it <laughs> flung him into the dead. And, and some people have even suggested, and I'm not sure I agree, that for what they've suggested is, is in Mark, this is how Mark, when Jesus becomes son of God, when the spirit descends and rests on him. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think so. Certainly the other evangelists don't believe that. That's why you have a birth story in Matthew and a birth story in Luke. That's why you have the prelude, the eight, first 18 verses of John, you know, that describes Jesus, you know, the word coming down from heaven. You know, you've got other things, but, you know, he, here certainly he is empowered to do something now, you know, after he's been tested. So he's been empowered, he's been tested. Now's the time for him to do what? Begin his ministry, and that's what we're going to look at next time. So read, if you would, chapter 1, 14 through 45. And this is going to be the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Uh, in a sense, I think what Mark does is Mark gives us a prelude and a postlude. And the core of the gospel we're getting ready to start. In other words, this little beginning is a little beginning to set us up for Jesus' ministry. He's going to start showing himself to be the Christ. At the end, he's already established as son of God. The, the resurrection is, for Mark, I think, it's almost a postlude. You know, this prepares us for him to come back. So, but this is when his ministry gets started. Basically, he was just showing us now he has the authority to begin. Now he has the authority to begin. He has the power to begin. He's been tested, you know, just like you'd say. Not found you know, warning. and not found warning. He is ready to go, and he's going to start his ministry in chapter, uh, chapter one, well, verse fifteen. Nancy, you? Uh, <laughs> and and li when you read that, listen to some of the words. Pay attention to some of the words Mark uses to describe it, because they, they, everything he says is going to have to do with who Jesus is as a Christ. What does it mean to say Jesus is the Christ? Okay? All right, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to look at your word. Uh, remind us that when Jesus came to do his thing, man, he was empowered and he was ready to do it. Uh, and help us as we look towards him, help us to remember that, that he is one, the one who came to fulfill this, uh, this prophecy that, that John laid before us. We are on the other side of the cross, therefore we can enjoy this baptism of Holy Spirit that John could only anticipate. Remind us of that in the name of Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.